finishing that song with the words, you are a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. All of who God is, is love. And all he calls us to is to be love to other people. This morning, our message is entitled, Now is the time to wake up. Now is the time to wake up. And the text is coming from Romans chapter 13, verses 10 to 14. And I read, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly pleading that as we look into your word, we'll have open hearts, open minds, desiring to follow you, desiring to be obedient. Lord, we ask that you fill us with your spirit through your word this morning. May it be you speaking. May we be hearers and doers of your word. May your name be praised. May I remain humble in the process. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This week I heard a story told of a basketball coach in the U.S. by name Cotton Fitzsimmons of the Atlanta Hawks. And he was playing a game with the Boston Celtics. And his team was on a losing streak, weeks upon weeks upon weeks of losing. And so in this game, he decided to give a pep talk to get his team moving forward. So he called them aside and said, this week, this game, pretend you are not a losing team. You are a winning team. Pretend you are not playing an ordinary game. Pretend you are playing the championships. Pretend you have the best players. Pretend it's all going to be well. The team get onto the field. They start to play. And they were beaten badly. At the end, the coach was upset, very angry. And started yelling at the, the, the team players. Then as they came off the court... The captain came to him, tapped him on his back, he said, cheer up, cheer up, pretend we won. <laughs> now, the essence, the essence of that is to draw our attention back to the text. The text, the title says, now is the time to wake up. There is some time in our lives, things may be happening all around us, and we pretend Sometimes we pretend not to see, not to be aware. Other times we don't pretend, but we just go to bed. We just sleep and are not awake to the happenings of our time. Our world is changing rapidly, so rapidly that we cannot keep abreast with what's happening around us. And we can only lean on God's word and be sure that 
That is our only source of truth. That's our only source of hope. Paul was writing this text to the believers in Rome. He was staying in Corinth while writing this letter to the believers. That city was full of sin. It was a port city, prosperous, lots of people coming in, trading, making money, and it was all about fun having, money making, and sinfulness was rife. And so he penned this letter to the believers who lived in that community, in that city, to wake up, to be aware of what's happening around them and not remain asleep. And I'll start off with a few things he had said prior. He had focused on love. He had focused on them renewing their mind and thinking on things above, not on things on earth. And he had come to this point in his letter where he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. When you look at the The Greek word neighbor in that text, it talks of any other man, irrespective of race, religion, with whom we live or whom we chance to meet. Your neighbor is anybody else. Doesn't matter their religion, doesn't matter their race, doesn't matter at all. All that matters is this is just another person. And the text is telling us that love does no wrong to a neighbor. In church, we may even say, oh, when we gather, we are not neighbors. We are brothers and sisters. So even more closer. Yet, the way we engage sometimes we do not think beyond ourselves. And we do things that harm and hurt other people. And Paul is encouraging the believers of the time to recognize that it's not only about us, us believers, and even the people who are unbelievers, the way we live should show them that we are love. Just like the song we sang, God is love. That's just who he is. Even in our sinful nature, he demonstrates love to us. When we go on further in the text, you look at verse 11. He says, besides love, besides love. So yes, we should love. We should love the neighbor. We should love the people around us. He says, besides that, know the time. Know the times in which we are. We are in a time where things are happening so quickly, changes are happening so quickly. A few weeks back, Saskatchewan passed a law about parental rights. And parents were happy, and some young people went demonstrating. Why should my parents have a right to decide? or to be known, to, to know that I am going to make a change in school regarding my name, regarding my identity. We can't keep up with the changes happening around us. We just can't keep up. And the only place we can have hope and confidence is in God's word. As we look at the text, it says, wake up from sleep. When you sleep, that is the time you are idling. You, I don't know about you, but when I sleep, I have slept. I'm, I'm gone. You can do whatever you're doing around me. I won't hear you. Maybe when you sleep, a little noise wakes you up. But the, the, the mindset here is, let's be alert. Let's be alert to the things happening around us. In our homes in our communities, in our schools, around us, because they impact us. 
Paul goes on to talk about salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Even back then, he had the sense of urgency. We've been saved. The coming of our Lord is near. Let us be diligent in our work with the Lord. That's why he says that. Salvation is nearer now than when we were saved. And I can imagine for the number of seniors in this church who've been in this church for years, you may have been saying to yourself, way back then, oh, maybe Jesus will come in my time. Oh, maybe Jesus will come in my time. You've been here 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Jesus has not come. And even that message was given way ahead. And we are receiving that message now that salvation is nearer than before. The happenings in our time, the wars. Israel is at war. Russia is at war. And the very different places that there is instability. What should that tell us? We should be aware of the things happening around us. And be alert. We go to verses 12. It says, The night is gone. Day is at hand. Believing that at night you can't function very well. You can't do very much. We work in the day and sleep at night. And so in his text he's saying that time of sleep and rest and idling is over. The time to act is now. Now. Do you have an opportunity to act now? Do I have an opportunity to act now? I believe we all have opportunity to act now. Be alert. Be awake to the happenings around us. He goes on further and talks of, let us cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. I'm going to try and analyze this exactly the way he's saying it. When we become believers, we know Christ. Our sinful nature doesn't change. We make our minds that we will follow Christ and we, our mind, our life, our hope, our everything is based on Jesus, who he is and who he has called us to be. But we are still human. And so you don't need to go and wear things to do dark stuff. You're already wearing it. So he says, take it off. I'll say it again. Everybody, be it a believer or an unbeliever, has that Adamic nature in them and so tendency to sin. And so Paul is addressing us and telling us, hey, for that which is part of who you are, you need to take it off. You need to be aware and take it off. Take it off and live the life Put on the armor of light. You realize what he is asking us to do doesn't come naturally. You will have to put it on. You don't have it within you. You will have to go get it and put it on. Put on the armor of light. It's not because you become a believer, then the armor of light just comes to you. No, you will have to go get it and put it on. How do you wear that armor of light? The armor... It's a protection as well as it helps you to fight. So it helps you to attack at the same time helps you to protect yourself. Now, is it possible that you could be a believer and decide not to wear the armor of light? It is very possible. God is light. His truth, his word is where we should be focused and where our lives should be focused on. And if you are so busy with the everyday things of life, 
the everyday things of life which won't count when Jesus comes. They're waking up, they're going to work, they're taking care of children, the farming, the business, the banking, the investments, the visiting, the traveling, the holidaying, they don't count. It's all zero. It's all zero. And that doesn't help you to wear that armor of light. To wear the armor of light, to be in his word. It's to be in his word. And so if we become so busy with the things that don't count in life, so much so that even a 45 minutes time in his word, I don't have that time. An hour in his word, I don't have that time. A 30 minutes prayer, I don't have that time. I must go. I must meet this person. I must do this. I must do that. You will not be wearing that armor of light. You will be open to the attacks from the enemy. Remembering that you are to take off something which you are already wearing. The darkness. You are already wearing it. It's the light that shines into the darkness to take away that darkness. And as I read this, I started asking myself, how many of us take God's word as primary, the core of who we are, beyond anything else? And that's the question for each of us to answer. And I've been tracking the things that are happening in the world of addiction. Why? Because I worked in an addiction recovery center before. And so when I see a law passed, I am eager to know what's going on there. When changes come, I'm eager to know what's going on there. And in 2022, May, the Minister of Health in British Columbia helped pass a law. What did the law say? That they got, they received exemption to decriminalize illegal drugs for personal use from Health Canada. And they were given a tenure of six years, no, three years to practice this, starting January 2023. So they got the approval in May, so they passed the law. Oh, if you have illegal drugs, small one for personal use, it's okay. Go and enjoy it. By October 4th, 2023, they done a U-10. No, busy government introduces a bill to ban illicit drug use in many public places. Where are we going? And if you, if you read what the minister said when she was campaigning for this to be passed. He said, according to Caroline Bennett, Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and Associate Minister of Health, eliminating criminal penalties for those carrying small amounts of illicit drugs for personal use will reduce stigma and harm and provide another tool for British Columbia to end the overdose crisis. You know what has happened? It didn't take them one year to realize the overdose has gone up. That is not the way to solving the problems of addiction. We can't look to the world for solution. We can only look to God and his word. And I dare say to each and every one of us, it is not something you pick and choose when you would want to follow God. It is a daily, consistent, intentional decision you make for yourself to say, I want to follow God every day of my life. That is what we are called to. To be in the light, that's what we are called to. And I'll share with you what God shared with the children of Israel when he gave them his word, and said, keep it in your heart. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6.
to 9. But I'll read from 5. Okay? It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What does that tell you about God's word? What does that tell you? If you want to, if you want to teach your children, you want it to be a part of who you are, it's not a passive thing. It's not a passive thing you do when you have time, when you feel like it. It's an intentional thing. You are committing into memory. You are reading. You are writing. You are posting it. So in your own home, you see it. It warns you. It warns you. Because that is the only source of strength to carry on in our day. The world can't provide any solution. The world has failed us, will continue to fail us. Every day. If we look to the world... We will fail. Let's go on to our text again. And we will see verse 13. He starts now, Paul starts to list the things that were happening back in the day. And you will think, oh, that was back in the day. So by this time, we who are matured, we who are more enlightened, we who are more modern and developed, we would have moved away from these things. He starts with orgies, right? He says, he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies. Orgies is used generally to describe feasts and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. So we may say to ourselves, oh no, this is a Mennonite community. These things don't happen. Well, maybe they don't. But let me just give you a hint of what's happening all around us. Steinbach is a place where many new immigrants are coming in. I've met lots of Filipinos, lots of Africans, lots of Chinese, lots of Indians. And what do they do? We all bring our culture. We all bring our beliefs. We all bring the way we worship into that space. And whatever we bring, we bring with us the good, the bad and the ugly. And for the Mennonite community that started Steinbach, that knew God, that taught everything is about God to their children, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunties, please, it can't work that way anymore. Just because we taught them, they know they would be protected. It doesn't work that way anymore. There's a lot of influence. A lot of negative influence all around us now that we must go back to what God's word says in Deuteronomy. When you sit, when you walk, when you sleep, when you walk with your child Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, or in your home, what conversations do you strike? Oh, the Jets scored a goal. Oh, yeah, the Blue Bombers. Is, is that what goes on all the time? If the Blue Bombers, knowledge about their performance and the statistics won't send us anywhere, but that becomes the biggest part of our conversations. Are we missing it somewhere? 
Are we missing it somewhere? So that's about orgies, drinking parties and late nights, roaming around. Recently on the news I had one man or boy or young person, whatever, was driving at 137 kilometers in a 50 zone. When they checked, he was drunk. That's part of that. That's part of that. He may not be here, he may not be a member, but he may have an influence on any of us, depending on our association and our networks. The next one is drunkenness. They are tied together. And I will say, Paul says something at the very end, which I find very significant. He says, the last, last, very last in 14, he says, make no provision. Make no provision for the flesh. No provision. None at all. So if you don't want your children to drink alcohol, don't drink alcohol. Don't drink alcohol around them. Don't fantasize about it and say, oh, I was just joking, and then you make alcohol jokes or drunken jokes. Don't. Don't bring that into that space. And I was reading the biography of uh, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, sharing his life, how he got involved with smoking and drinking. He said, when he was a little kid, right in his home, when his mother had hired workers to come and build their home, the workers were smoking. He found it fun. So when they smoke, then they throw a the little piece and he would take it and also try it and try to check it out. And the workers were excited by that little kid following them. And so they kept tossing more to him, tossing more to him till he felt it was an okay thing. And for many years, he was drinking and smoking. In his own words, that's where he picked it from. So when God's word says, make no provision, no provision at all, none whatsoever, if you can protect your children from it, do, because that's what will either introduce them to it or Help them stay away from it. I'll move to the next one quickly. And he talks of sexual immorality. Oh, that's the one we don't have any problem with. Yeah, we are Mennonites. You know, we live in a Mennonite community. Everybody's great. We don't have any problem with that. But, sorry, that forms part of the bigger part of our problems. With loneliness, Less people getting married, people are more tempted to get here. Last week, while I was preparing, I just went online to see what's happening in that world for we who are ministers of God. And sadly, two scandals. One in Zimbabwe, Africa, where I come from, and one in North America across the bridge over there, the U.S. So the... the Sex scandal involving the um, Zimbabwe minister. He was having a relation, sexual relation with one of the church members, a young church member. And he went very excited about talking about it on a phone call with somebody and the person recorded and put that message on the church WhatsApp page. He couldn't take it. He went to hang himself. That's how he ended it. The second one, International House of Prayer founder, faces sexual misconduct allegations. Please don't say, oh, this may be internet gymnastics. I watched the church service of that church where the leaders were up front in somber mood and asking for prayer as they go through this with an external body to investigate. What does that do to us as a body of Christ? What does that do to us? It weakens our testimony. It makes us look bad. It makes it impossible for us to be witnesses for Christ. And this is not... 
This is the height of it. This is the very top of it. The very top. Being that there are little, little things that begin before we get here. It doesn't start from here. No. It may begin with a text message. An improper text message. Unnecessary, extended, looking, desiring, hanging on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. Oh, I'm bored. Let me check out some fun things here and there. And then the devil has prepared stuff for you to see and people to engage with. Before long, that's where we may land. I will take us to a list of things that way back then, way back, Three thousand four hundred years ago, God was warning the children of Israel. Three thousand four hundred years ago, way back then, because we're talking of incest. So, if 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 you if you want to know about the 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 chapter that talks about sexual immorality, big time, you find that in Leviticus chapter eighteen, all forms, all shapes. But I kid you not. Human beings are crafty and creative. As the years have gone by, we have added our own versions. This is just the, the I would say, this is the prototype. We have gone way deeper than what you see there. Such that today, oh, polyamorous relationships, we, we don't need to commit to anything. Go hang out with anybody, anytime, anywhere, but we are married and we just, I mean, there is no limit. There's no limit. And I was reading, reading online where tech is going. Technology is saying, we are preparing for men who are lonely. We, will, we are making artificial, using AI, artificial intelligence to create females to be able to satisfy men. Women will not be needed pretty soon. And people start to comment, oh yeah, we are waiting for that time. Wonderful time ahead. Where are we going as people? Where are we going? And we know, I believe you know just as well as I do, when immorality sets into the home, it's not only the husband and the wife who get in a mess, the children get in a mess. And when the children get in a mess, it doesn't stop right there. They take you to school. An unhappy kid chooses to bully other people. I mean, it... It's just continuous. Sooner than later, they associate with others because they are deviants, or whatever it is, they, the direction they choose to go, and they may then choose to associate with people who choose to do wrong all the time. And we wonder why. We wonder why. Paul is telling us in the text, run away from sexual immorality sensuality sensuality using of filthy words indecent dressing indecent dances promoting this normally comes through music film photography dance comedy reality shows the list is unending all it takes is get your sensual emotion started and then you slowly move from sensuality to the sexual immorality itself. And you know what? He categorizes this as life in the darkness. These things are done oftentimes at night under the cover of darkness. That's why he says, walk in the light. Come in the daytime. Live your life in the daytime. That's what Paul is calling us to. The next, he talks about quarreling. Quarreling. Where does quarreling come from? Why do we quarrel? And is that a problem we have? We may say, no, we don't have those problems. But I tell you, if you have pride issues, it could 
spark off a misunderstanding with somebody because the person doesn't see eye to eye with you. You have control issues, it could lead to that. If you like to abuse the power you have, it could lead to that. Oh, you want to be in charge of everything. You want to have your hand in every little thing. It could lead to quarrels. And are there quarrels in our homes? Are there quarrels in our churches? Are there quarrels in our workplaces? Probably there are. He's calling us to walk in the light. Remembering always whatever he says, go back to what he said at first. Love doesn't hurt a neighbor. Love does not hurt a neighbor. That's, that's, the, that's the premise. Love does not hurt a neighbor. They say, besides that, watch out for these things. Watch out for these things. The last one is jealousy. Jealousy. And it arises from comparison. Comparing yourself to other people. To check it out whether they are ahead of you or you are ahead of them or we are balanced. Or we all finished school at the same time. Or we all started work at the same time. Or we all went to that place, at the, went through training at the same time. How come they've been able to buy a house with nobody house? How come they've been able to buy that nice car we didn't buy? How come they've got promotion I didn't get? You start to do that, the next thing you know is jealousy. It's always going to lead you to jealousy. God made you unique. Your opportunities are unique. And there is no need for comparison. People who compare themselves to other people always ended up doing destructive things. You know Cain and Abel? Cain and Abel? One's sacrifice was accepted, the other was not. What happened? The first murder in the Bible. Comparison. Why me? Why, why me? Remember last week? Leah, Rachel? Yeah. A marriage with two women which was created by an uncle who was mischievous. Because of comparison, it became a marriage of four women. Comparison. Sarah, Abraham's wife, Hagar. Hagar has a child. I didn't have a child. It's confusion. Get out of the house. When we compare, jealousy steps in. Catch yourself when you begin to compare. Catch yourself and be aware that you are slowly moving into the life of darkness. That's the six things he listed. And I'm coming quickly to finish up with the 14 where he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul emphasizes this over and over and over again. Whenever he writes, he emphasizes this. Go to Ephesians, he's emphasizing. Go to Galatians, he's emphasizing that. Put on Christ, put on Christ. What does it mean to put on Christ? Carry on life such that when people see you, they see Christ's likeness in you. The way you talk, the way you behave, the way you think should be like Christ. It's not simple. It's not easy. It is a striving thing. You strive to be more like Christ. How do you become more like Christ when your only chance to read God's word is when we come here? How? How would you even know how he wants you to be? How? How can your children see the value in this when they don't even see you read it? How? Hey, my children, read God's word. Let it become valuable to you. I'm busy. I'm going somewhere. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Put on Christ is put on that covering of love that loves the neighbor doesn't matter who the neighbor is. However way he or she is, you love that neighbor. You show kindness. You are forgiving. You are gentle. You seen Christ get angry and fight people and all that? No. No. Very gentle. Very peaceful. Very forgiving. 
and loving to the sinner. That is what Paul is calling us to. And as I end, my encouragement to all of us is that wake up. Wake up. Night is gone. The time to act is now. We don't know when he is coming. He says he will come like a thief in the night. When you least expect, he would arrive. And when he arrives, all of what you did on this earth, you'll have to account for it. Not because you are not saved. You are saved, yes. But it's time to account for your service to him so he can reward you. There's a song that goes like, must I go and meet him empty-handed? Is that how you want to go and meet your Lord? You want to go and meet him empty-handed? Or with a trailer of um, fine goods you stored up here? It's not going anywhere. Anything you, earn, anything you gain here, anything you, you manage to acquire here, it's going nowhere. It remains here. May God help us to have our eyes fixed on him and wear Christ in all of our engagements. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you. We give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you for Paul and his words to us as we leave in very, very challenging times for our young people, even for adults and the seniors. We all need you. We all need to know more of you. We all need to wear you so when people see us, they see Christ-likeness. They see you in us. Father, we are weak. We ask that you forgive us. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us for giving room for the enemy to come into our families, into our marriages, into our lives, and other things that affect us. Help us to wake up from sleep and be at work for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.